everybody. Happy Saturday morning. I hope all of you are more awake than me, but more importantly, I want you all to roll more dice than me. Hit me with those d20s. Let's see who's doing the recap. I rolled a 17. I just gave you some nice oh. dice ASMR yeah, to, to work I, with. I can feel the shivers on the back of my neck. Hey, Ten. I got a one. Oh, thank goodness. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> I had a 13. Uh, fuck me with the chainsaw. Chatter, what did you get? You Ten. Ten. Ten oh, yeah, Ryan. Good. Uh, I got 17. Uh, so, Matthew, what happened on our last session of Dicey Waters? We made the decision to go out to the native encampment mm -hmm. in the quest for Masak. And we get there and, you know, the village is kind of quiet. And so we realize people are like hiding in like the town hall or, you know, it's locked in there. So eventually we're just like, OK, well, if we can't go in this way, then we're going to, you know, just break in. So then Locke and I teleport in while Jetta's trying to climb through a window. Yeah. I, I have already edited that bit. And can I say the muted background sound of mid-conversation, <laughs> Jetta thwacking her head into the glass warms my heart. <laughs> So we decided, uh, we found out, I think, because I ended up using suggestion or something to like force her to tell us, which is mm -hmm. honestly kind of questionable. But we find out that there was going to be a ritual that uh, Masak had been like preparing in effort to get revenge against the mage lords. We found out that the last fountain was, there was like a cave system that's underneath the mm -hmm. encampment. And so we were heading out towards the cliffs in an effort to find the entrance to the cave. One last bit of detail is that the way you discovered the location of the fountain was Jetta casting Flock of Familiars <laughs> to summon three mice named Stuart, Jerry, and Ratatouille oh, to perform right. reconnaissance. <laughs> yep. And we ended with Jetta saying under her breath, gotcha, you son of a bitch. <laughs> and that's where we're going to pick up. Standing outside of the longhouse, Jetta has just said, gotcha, you son of a bitch, indicating that she has learned the location of the fountain. So everybody else, you can assume that the mouse plan has worked flawlessly. And you all look to Jetta, trying to figure out what you're going to do next. He's got something in a cave oh, over by the cliffs. What exactly were the exact directions you gave? I know it was like a cave in the cliffs. Yes, that, I mean, that is essentially what you know. The The village okay. is sort of set near the precipice of a massive cliff ridge along the uh, northwestern border of the Arianor Island. Um, and there are uh, directions written and some small illustrations saying docks by the cliffs. So not a geographical location, but close to the village, cliffs nearby. Good sense that that's probably a good place to look. Okay, so I, I called the mice back to me, like, okay, guys, let's get get out of there. And all the all the mice respond in their uh, in their varied attitudes, like, okay, I'm coming back. Do you have my cheese? And they're slowly making their way out of the building. It'll take a minute. So the mice have not arrived as everyone else continues to look at you for information. Are the, are the rats like speaking telepathically or are they? You telepathically. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Jetta can telepathically communicate with her familiars. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> you guys are not hearing the radical cheese demands yeah, of Ratatouille. I yeah, I didn't know if we had some Chucky, <laughs> some Charles Entertainment cheeses around that were just kind of riffing. So, so yeah, no, I tell them that, uh, that uh, there's a dock by the cliff. It's hidden. We should go there and look for it. Um, um, let's do it. Yeah, uh, fine. It's, everybody seems so off. Is everybody? I feel like I'm repeating conversations occasionally. It's very weird. Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny how that keeps happening. <laughs> <laughs> Just having an off day. The bickering is interrupted by three small mice leaping off of the building, riding the breeze to land on Jetta's shoulders. It's pretty. Uh, it's pretty unsanitary. Just good. As, I, as I like put an arm around a rotting corpse. Uh, again, Jerry's still not with you. I also want to be very oh, clear. <laughs> I want to be very clear that of the mice that land on you, Jetta, Ratatouille is not the one that lands on your head. Uh, who, nice. Who lands on my head? Stuart. Stuart. Got gotcha. you. Oh my god. That's how a mouse would say Stuart. Yeah, that's true. Anyways, uh, I reach into my rations and like pull out cheese and crackers. All right, you guys earned this. 
And the three of you, although you can't hear what the mice are saying to Jetta, two of them look happy to eat the cheese. One of them has like a death glare, like it's about fucking time. And you can't really, like, <laughs> I don't know why this mouse is so angry, but it is. Uh, anyways, I, I start going to the cliffs, yeah. All right, it's not that far of a walk, assuming you all move together. There are clear borders to the town in the form of like various uh, wood fences, uh, some of which are like small to keep in sheep. Others are clearly more meant to keep out individuals. But after maybe five to 10 minutes, you exit some of these uh, fenced doorways and see that the grass begins to roll down and the sheer drop ahead of you is apparent. If you continue to step forward, you will see the ocean growing bigger and bigger in your vision, starting at the horizon and taking up everything because these cliffs are much higher than most of the uh, than most of the rock faces we've been seeing. It is a pretty significant drop down to the ocean below. But you stand on the edge of a cliff with a mission. What do you do? Don't let the intrusive okay. thoughts win. Don't let the intrusive thoughts win. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody have a way down? Because <laughs> you just call just leaps off. No, um... <laughs> I could, uh, you know, I fed the fall if you want to, like, more of a general slow descent. I could fly, I think. Ooh, I, how many, I have a question. Uh, there's four of us, right? We're, we don't have any NPCs kicking around, right? Correct. It's just the four of you and the mice. And the mice. If, on, if only I had a rope of climbing, but I don't. Don't you have boots? I, I could burn a six level spell I have one of those so we could use it mm -hmm. for fly and all of us could fly no that's that's overkill we can just climb Actually, down I gave somebody a climbing item in my campaign so I don't want to hear it yeah no I have I have a rope of climbing but this isn't the same Jetta oh god damn it <laughs> wow <laughs> yeah Pat why didn't you see exactly yeah. where the story was leading <laughs> through two different DMs discreet plans yeah, why, <laughs> didn't you, why didn't you give a multi-dimensional rope of climbing yeah That'd be, why didn't you back up your shit to iCloud your yeah. Maybe it's gonna polymorph herself into an eagle. Oh, nice. Does Misty Step keep uh, my momentum? I'm gonna say <laughs> yes. I feel like we had this. This is before. this is not like a destiny jump where you can just torpedo your momentum at the last second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Maeve, as you guys all rummage through your bags, call it you consider your spells. Uh, Locke is like jumping up and down in place, trying to get a feel for how his momentum might shift. Maeve is now a bird and just starts eagle screeching next to you. Caw! Uh, Caw! All right, well, I'm gonna just take my regular rope. Caw! Uh, use, like, use my uh, pins and uh, hammer and stuff to like secure the rope and then climb down the rope. Hopefully nothing Lock, happens. whatever revelation you're about to have be, occurs while Jetta is mounting herself to this thing and starting her descent. Can we have a small, I don't know if Matt is okay with this, but Matt could become a giant eagle and could potentially carry somebody down like Gandalf. Um, I've actually, that's up, I think that's I probably would have uh, done that. I have the stat block for giant eagle here, but I just said eagle. Sure. So it's less of a caw and more of like a caw. Uh, <laughs> Caw, caw. This, e this eagle's <laughs> balls have dropped. Oh, my yeah. God. Oh. But, yeah, I I'll cast fly on myself, and then maybe that'll solve uh, the momentum problem for Locke. You're telling me that the 11-year-old girl turned into a male giant eagle? I don't know. It's called polymorph. We're dealing with some sort of morphing, so whatever. And that giant eagle went through puberty already? Which is more extreme, changing into a different gender a thing that happens a lot, or changing into a bird, a thing that hasn't happened very much as far as I know. That's fair. I just feel like <laughs> you run with some square circles, though, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm looking at the giant eagle stat block, too. Um, yeah, it'll look at lock and call and just kind of. Here's the thing, though. We have established some role play tent poles regarding the polymorph spell in that where Wild Shape allows you to keep your mental faculties. Yes. Polymorph does not. But the thing is, I think giant eagles are actually kind of smart. They have an eight intelligence and a 14 wisdom going off the base stat block. But look, eight is just below average. That's fair. They are smart, but I would say still animals. So, you know. If we're going by, if we're going by strictly what the spell says, 
The target's game statistics, including mental score abilities, are replaced by the statistics of the Chosen Beast. Mm -hmm. It retains its alignment and personality. Mm -hmm. So it's still Maeve, but it's, you know... I'm just curious, what's the delta on that intelligence? Because what's Maeve's intelligence? (laughs) Twelve. Twelve. Okay, so yeah, so maybe it's, not It's just really not that bad. A little flowers for Algernon. Not quite the end of the story. <laughs> uh, so Maeve, now a giant eagle, stands in front of you. Called his cast fly on himself. Uh, how do you all proceed? Fly? It's in the. <laughs> it's in the word. Yes, I said all. You're not all, Ryan. It's not all about call. I'm. I'm just gonna climb down the rope. <laughs> okay. I would like the eagle route. I'm gonna keep a close eye on. Um... On Jetta, I'm going to have a fe- feather fall just kind of like in the wings. <laughs> okay. Jetta, I would wings. like you to roll uh, I would like you to roll athletics for me. Okay. 15. 15, okay. Uh, Jetta, you begin your slow descent uh, down the top of the cliff without much incident. You see that cult is hovering nearby, keeping an eye on your progress, and feel a giant whoosh of air as Locke bird surfs down the side of the cliff on Maeve's back, and very quickly begins his descent with her to the bottom. So, like, how big is a giant eagle? Because, like, Locke I is a big, heavy dude. They're classified as a uh, Large. As okay. large, yeah. So, they fit, yeah. that's a, they, I mean, if you put it on what a size map, of a horse? A 10-foot yeah. square. Yeah, sky horse. That, that's me. Scores. <laughs> I am only 225. Yeah, fine. Okay. Yeah, that, giant eagle that, can handle that's that. That's heavy. Get out of here. So everybody is kind of moving with great ease, except for Jetta, who is slowly making her way down the cliff. How long is this rope, Jetta? 50 feet. 50 feet. You make it near the end of your rope riding this athletics check, and you see you are nowhere near the bottom of this cliff. It is extraordinarily high, and the further down you climb, the higher it seems, as you get a sense for what traversing it actually feels like. Uh, The bird will stop at the bottom... Of the room. I've made a great miscalculation. <laughs> uh, Maeve has perched next to you. Call is hovering next to you. You have two avenues of escape. If only your ego could step aside. What do you do, Jack? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a long way down. You sure you don't, you know, want some form of assistance? Yeah. I am c- c- debating just taking the drop. <laughs> uh, I take the eagle. At least the eagle can't sass me. Car! Sassy. <laughs> I don't understand the sass. <laughs> no, Maeve wouldn't do that. Uh, Matt, I am going to have Maeve make a uh, strength check just to ensure that you can carefully balance these two individuals. While you may have the muscle mass, it is difficult. So please roll a strength check. Uh, with the eagle. I would like to clarify that like, I'm not on the eagle's back, but like hanging off the legs. I could pick him up in my talons, maybe. Roll that strength. Uh... 13. Maeve, you pick up Jetta in your talons and stop flapping in an attempt to ride the wind down and glide further down the cliffside. But the wind is a little stronger than you expect, and while you don't feel as though you're going to lose your grip, it is a bit of a turbulent ride. Locke and Jetta, please roll a dexterity saving throw. Jetta, you have advantage because you're being gripped rather than hanging on yourself. I got a 15. 10 plus 4, 14. Locke and Jetta, you feel the turbulence as Maeve rustles in the wind. And Locke, even though you feel the wind pushing you off of her back, you are able to easily grip the feathers. And Maeve, you adjust to Locke's shifting balance on top of you just in time to feel Jetta slip your grasp. As your talons loosened, Jetta did not grab on in time. And Jetta has slipped into free fall and is now falling down a cliff that is easily hundreds of feet high, moving toward the rocks and water below. What I want to try to do is, like, take out my daggers and, like, stab them into the side of the cliff, hoping that'll, like, slow my fall. You are far enough removed from the cliff that when you whip out your daggers and you swing them, you are grabbing nothing. The air moves around them as you careen towards the ground. Sorry, again, careen towards the water. Again, we face our greatest adversary in this game, gravity. Uh, yeah, I told I, you I was going to throw all of you off of something. It's coming true. If Chowder's okay with it, I would do Featherfall, just so you know, there's less death. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, I don't have Featherfall prepared. <laughs> 
fuck. Oh, me. No. Oh, no. no. Let me double. Give me. Yeah, just give me one sec. Y'all continue. No, I'm waiting for this. This is definitely going to determine uh, what I do next. Uh, yeah, no, well, I'm all stacked up on spells. I didn't forget it, so. I, I maybe I'll rush in and try and save like Superman. Okay, but frail so and very what old. Is, what is your fly speed? It's sixty, 60 feet per feet second, right? Per second. Okay, let me see. Um, what is the typical falling speed in D and D? Five hundred feet in six seconds, according to Cora. Well, technically speaking, if you want to do it rules, it's immediate. Like it's not even like over the course of rounds. Like you immediately fall take the damage unless Feather Fall is cast as a reaction. Yeah, but that's a stupid rule, so... No, yeah, it's I a really like, stupid rule that yeah, makes zero I don't, sense. I don't like, I don't, yeah, I don't <laughs> like that read. Um, I'm gonna treat this as speed. Cult, you are... Your fly speed is 60 feet. And yes. I'm gonna say that because Maeve already began the descent, you are about 60 feet above Jetta when you notice her slip. So, Jetta, you are in free fall. Maeve, you're not too far, but you're all, any movement that you take to try to save her, I'm going to have a check associated with it, because that's what got us here. Cult, you could try to make some moves to go get her, but we are talking the fact that you are going to be pretty far behind. So let me know what you guys want to do, and I'll resolve it. Okay. I guess I could burn a fourth level spell and cast Fly on myself and Jetta. What's the range of Fly? Do I to, oh, it's Touch. I have to touch. Oh, that's not great. Okay. Uh, oh, is, okay. Is there any world that I can catch up to Jetta? You can make an attempt to catch up to Jetta just through sheer movement. With a 60-foot fly speed, you can descend at 60 feet per second. You can also dash. Now, I'm not counting this as any sort of initiative, uh, but I'm not going to let you, like, dash a million times in a row and just, like, instead appear. But can I, can mm -hmm. I offer a slight... Uh, argument. Um, mm -hmm. So basically I would like cease, you know, I'm thinking about it in like Superman terms. I would use gravity, so I would be falling the exact same rate, relative and speed as Jetta, and then I would be increasing it with my fly speed. I don't th I, it's it's not that it has because I mean if you think about the way it actually works, like if you if you're falling and then you have thrust going against you you're going to fall as fast as gravity pulls you unless your thrust would exceed that speed. Like, it, it's not it, its not purely additive. Mm. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's purely it's, additive. It's, it's, it's purely yeah, additive. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, how, that's how thrust works. works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Then, oh, yeah, cool. Then, yes, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, if you're going down, you would also fall at 60 feet per second. You can add the movement of fly, and you can dash. This is basically all, right. all the action for this instance that you can take. So any other things that you do in this moment wouldn't be actions. They would have to be reactions. At least from this, I want to get a hand on Jetta, and then I'll be able to cast a spell like the next time, if we're not dead. Jetta, you have whipped out your knives to grab the cliff, but when you reach out, you swing and you hit nothing. Locke and Maeve, you are looking in horror as Jetta slips down to the water beneath you at incredible speed. And before you can react, like a missile next to you, the, the waving beard and cloak of cult shoot straight down. Jetta, you are tumbling and swinging. I would like you to make a deck save. Yep. Unnatural 20. You just barely managed to keep your grip on the knife as you expected it to grab onto something, but that momentum sends you tumbling further and further, and you are seeing the ground, you, you are seeing the cliff, then the water, then the sky, over and over but there is a strange dot in the sky that gets bigger and bigger every time until the wrinkled bearded visage of Kalt is nose to nose with you and you feel his dastardly embrace whip you even faster down. Kalt, you have successfully grappled Jetta in midair as you are about halfway down this enormous cliff getting closer and closer to the choppy waters below. Maeve and Locke, you are about 200 feet above them at the time that you can take more actions regarding the situation. But you two are still falling with the additional acceleration of fly. What do you do? I'm going to whisper in a genesis, I always wanted to go with somebody. No, I always wanted to go with somebody else. <laughs> oh I'm, I'm too busy screaming. I'm burning through, burning through spell slots here. I'm going to cast a fourth level spell slot. Uh, both of us will be able to fly now. Okay. I have a question that I don't think is in the rules for this spell, and I'm curious to see how you guys all feel about it. You <laughs> the have, momentum change? Not necessarily the momentum change. I think we can all deal with that. But fly, 
gives you the ability to control your movement in three dimensions. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything about casting the spell that would immediately give her the awareness of this? That, like, they now know that she can fly? Yeah. <laughs> That's a great psychological question. I mean, does it have a vocal component to it? I believe vocal somatic and material so like i'm i've got like a little feather fucking out and i'm like waving it over us <laughs> like she probably she's seen me cast fly before so she probably has some idea of what okay. i'm doing if her eyes are open yeah. i can read that uh you and you whisper the spell into her ear jetta you're freaking the fuck out roll a wisdom save i i shouldn't have added that flavor that's a three plus whatever my wisdom is but it ain't gonna be enough if yeah, I waste Je- this spell slot on a dead Jetta, oh man. Not necessarily. We're at a point where if you've cast the spell, Jetta, you are aware of this. You feel Cult's grip on you slip because Cult knows he has cast the spell. But you're careening toward the water. You have no idea that the spell has been cast on you. You are still in absolute horror, screaming bloody murder as you reach the water. You are about to make impact with the surface of the ocean. I'm going to have you make one last constitution save. Okay. Risking it. Here, here goes the biscuit, man. 14. The water is approaching, and you are screaming the entire way down, but when you see that you're about to hit, and even though you aren't consciously aware that you have the ability to fly in this moment, something visceral in you harnesses that ability, and you float inches above the water to the point where the mist is splashing you in the face. You have been saved by Cult's spell and your own shaky resolve as Maven Locke slowly descends the cliffside safely. I uh, float my way over to a shore uh, and then just, uh, I'm on the ground, kissing kissing the ground. There there isn't really a shoreline here, but there Uh, are very large rocks that you can land on. So I'm going to say that you shakily make your way over to one of them, land on the rock, and begin kissing the ground beneath you. Oh, uh, that was awful. Wasn't that bad. Galt. It's fine. Galt, I, I know we've, like, you know, had our, our like, uh, uh, back and forth and, like, sarcastic jabs at each other, but I want you to know I earnestly and genuinely appreciate you. Oh, well, that's nice. Usually I'm met with the occasional odd glare. It's good to hear somebody appreciates it. This is maybe the first earnest expression of affection you've received in this entire campaign from anybody besides Jerry. Yeah, I am thinking about that. Like, you can see... You have lived in constant fear that these people are going to abandon you. At least once in adventure, it has crept into your mind, and you've said this, oh, did they ditch me? And here is Jetta saying, I earnestly appreciate you. I would like you to roll a wisdom save also. Roll roll to feel. Um, I roll a four. (laughs) Cult, you start saying, thank you very much, and the words catch in your throat a little bit, and you feel a swell of emotion. I don't know if that is expressed as tears, as crying, or as something else, but you aren't able to easily stifle this in your resolved sort of way, because this has not happened in your adventures. Oh, uh, uh, (laughs) yeah, uh, um, of course, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, similarly, Jetta, you've never seen Cult be flustered before, so this is just kind of an awkward interaction between the two of you. By the time Locke and Maeve arrive near the bottom of the cliff, uh, you just see two choked up, shaking weirdos floating near a rock in the middle of the ocean. Is this the beginning of Jolt? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Who knows? Call, to turn away from the awkwardness of the situation, you face the cliff wall looking for a cave just to see that it is sheer cliff wall for quite a ways around you. Um, not to say that you've gone in the wrong direction or anything, but, I mean, you basically went in a straight line down. The cliffs are kind of wrapping around this entire island. The cave is not directly here. If you want to communicate that, you can, but that's that's what's going on. You don't see the cave just yet. Well, I, mean, I don't know if I'd have to communicate it. If there's, like, mm. no cave in front of us, I think we can yeah. all see it. You know what? That's but a great point. I, I turn around thinking there is a cave, and, like, I ram my face into some rocks. <laughs> and I'm just like, <laughs> oh, no, 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 no cave. Maeve, you, with your eagle eyes, are able to spot the impact of Cult bumping into it, and you see that there's no cave. And you are in an excellent position to scout further. Uh, I will make a perception check with my eagle eyes. Uh, you have advantage on that because you have eagle eyes. Oh, I know. But did the listeners know? I was going to say it, and then you said it, you 
dummy. I'm I'm sorry. I have all this thunder I've stolen from you. Let me give it back. <laughs> no, keep your fucking thunder. Uh, 21. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. You, Maeve, spot a dock along the bottom of the cliff edge. A small, not shoddy, but definitely not like expensively produced dock not uh, there are like gaps in the wood it's a little rickety uh a little uneven and sort of like bobbing in the in the water with a very obvious trail of indents in the rock face ropes and ladders that would have made a descent much safer leading straight down to the dock if only you had gone maybe half a mile up the cliff wall and you spot this dock and are able to swing back. It takes a minute for you to fly there, fly back. But yes, you, you see the dock leading into an inlet and you are now aware of maybe a good start for where to find this cave. Yeah, I'll uh, take Maeve and uh, Mr. Locke. We'll, we'll go to that dock. Okay. Colt and Jetta, you two are standing on the rock and you look up at, Je- at Maeve. Maeve, do you make any sort of screeches, calls, or sounds as you fly? Sure, why not? You hear the call of Maeve the eagle in the sky as her giant eagle body disappears around the wrapped cliff and she flies out of your eyesight, presumably in the direction that you all want to go. All right. What do you do? I fly over to where, our, where we saw uh, Maeve. Eagle Maeve. Yeah. When you arrive at the dock, Maeve, you set down easily and lock. You can safely disembark onto this small dock. While a little rickety, it is sturdy. There are ropes and things. You can tell that there are likely boats that come to and from this place often. And boats, boats, you, boats. Boats, boats, boats. <laughs> and after a few <laughs> moments, you see Jetta and Colt appear around the wrapped cliff face. And Jetta, when you see this series of ladders and handholds and ropes going down the cliff, it's a little embarrassing, if not infuriating. <laughs> I have no, no, nothing to impose upon you, but... Um, there's a safe way built into the cliff right here, straight down to the dock. That, uh, nope, you know. Nope, shit, they would have to have a way down. Fuck me. <laughs> Call you descend down to the dock as Jetta angrily and embarrassedly grumbles next to you. But you've all made it. You have all reached this dock, and it very clearly does lead into a water filled cave into the underside of the cliff. Like, 50 feet is very high. Uh, how, how high can cliffs get, man, before it just becomes a mountain? The cliffs of Dover are 350 feet tall. I imagine, okay. like, if you go to the Grand Canyon, like, and you didn't know that it was a canyon and you were just on one side, would that be a cliff? Yeah, that's a cliff. I think, like, the Grand Canyon goes down, like, a really long ways. I don't even know how okay. high it is. Okay, fair enough. I guess I just don't have a good me- mental comprehension of how big 50 feet is. 50 feet would be like you jumped off of the roof of a three- to four-story building. Uh, well, uh, unless that was an hour-long fall, I'm gonna have my, uh, mice, uh, scout out the cave, you know? Go into the cave, basically get us, like, a mental map of the area, you know? I would like to remind you that I have specified that the cave is full of water and would likely require swimming or a boat to proceed further. Oh, rats can swim, though. I'm not saying it can't be done, but I want to clarify, this is not, you're not walking into this cave. Oh, I see. Did we... Did we take a boat with us? I'm, I'm sure there's a canoe somewhere around here. Car! Um, I, I turned out of eagle form. <laughs> hey, I turned into I a waiting. whale. <laughs> um, did somebody say boat? And then I pull out the friendship. <laughs> oh, yeah. nice. Hey, I like that as Maeve grows that's in power and wisdom, she also grows in quips. Yeah. You, Maeve, <laughs> as everyone fumbles over how to get in through the water, you ask your question and casually drop the friendship into the into the water in front of you. What do um, you turn it into? Do, can you describe the dimensions that we're working with here? Uh, it's sizable. I would say probably 20 to 25 feet in diameter, and the water <laughs> is maybe about halfway up that if you assume that this is, like, fully circular. Okay. Um, um, so sizable, not huge. I think I'm going to turn it into the OG pink ship. You do that. The yeah. form of the bell end. Yep. Long lost to the storm front surrounding Turtle Bay reforms in front of you. Yeah. 
Whether the three of you feel nostalgia, I do not know, but Jetta, you see a very ugly ship that is inferior to the one you've been sailing around in this whole time. <laughs> As this flat bottom thing that says bell end with the visage of a skull crafted into the steering wheel materializes in front of you. Oh, I get really happy for a second that I realize it's not Bell's head anymore. And then it's a cheap sat. facsimile. Yeah, I feel like we should be a little more discreet, you know, maybe have like a little canoe. Or long you know, we... memories aren't discreet. Memories are with you forever. <laughs> <laughs> well said, me. Well said. I hate myself so much. <laughs> and it, yeah, anyways, I rescind the scouting ahead with the mice thing because we're on a big ass mm-hmm. boat now. So fair well, enough. I figured it was you... a, it was a smaller boat and it had a has a flat it, bottom. A flat so bottom. I figured it would. Uh, you know, it'd be better for this. I am. I'll, I'll tell you right now that while some of the turns might be a little sharp, if you all board this boat and sail in, you won't have a problem entering the cave. It's very specific wording. I, I need to be specific. Let's uh, board this boat and sail in, I guess. All right, all aboard. You step onto the boat and trying to sail into this uh, cave, you will notice that there isn't a very strong current and propulsion is a question that you have yet to answer. In forming the boat, could I have made like oars or like paddles or maybe like a like a stick or something? Yeah, if you are intentionally would create oars with the boat, I would accept that. Maybe we'll grab one of the oars and start trying to pull at it and then realize that um, she's not very strong. <laughs> yeah. Can, can we get your, your, your best impotent strength sound? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> what was it all for then? You choose to be nothing. <laughs> oh! Damn it! I had aspirations for a new text tone. Nope. The three adults watch this small girl pull out an oar, lug it over the side of the the boat that is again larger than a canoe, so it's awkward to row this thing anyways, and just absolutely fail to row as the oar skims across the surface of the water. As she does it, she'll just kind of look over and be like, um, a, a little help here? <laughs> I will start doing it. All right. Okay. I'll, I'll take I'll take the other side and row as well, so. All right. You begin to row your way into the cave, gently down the stream, and Locke is so much stronger than Jetta that at first the boat just, like, hard turns to the right as, Je- as Locke pushes from the left, but you guys get your rhythm. You figure it out and you are able to gently cruise through this cave. There are some tough turns. There are some awkward fits, but nothing that you can't handle until the ground begins to rise from underneath the water and you can safely beach this bellend facsimile onto it and disembark onto solid ground. You make your way further down this cave and eventually reach a very large chamber that looks very similar to the space that the other cave born fountain was. And this is the confirmation that you were expecting because a third fountain does indeed exist here. There were three all along. You have located it and understand that whatever strange thing has happened with the three timelines, you have deduced your way through them and figured out that even though you don't know everything that's going on here, This must all be somehow connected. You gingerly step into the cave, noticing a lot of different native material, paraphernalia, weapons, armor, scattered all over the place. Tables with papers, not unlike you saw with Yanis. Uh, Locke, you recall in the the crystal cave that led to Fenwick in the crystal, that there were uh, Mage Lord materials all over the place there, too. Uh, You say... Weapons and armor and, and, you know, all sorts of materials and stuff. Anything of value mm-hmm. in around here? Let me know if you want to investigate. I would like to investigate, yes. Go ahead and roll an investigation check. As you all gingerly walk in towards the very obvious pink crystalloid fountain, Jetta peels off to the side, trying to ruffle through some of the different pieces of material. Jetta, give me the results of your roll, because... Mm-hmm. Yep, that is... 19. You don't find anything of objective value in terms of magic items, piles of gold, exquisite weapons. This is all kind of general fare, things that you've encountered before. 
but you breaking off to some of these tables on the side does reveal crazed scrawlings, not unlike those Yanis had as well, where Masak is writing, and you saw similar things in his quarters through the eyes of the mice right. in the longhouse, where there is sort of a hell-bent obsession on retaliating against the mage lords. Hmm. That at least in this timeline, after the departure of Bait, Cult, and Locke, the conflict did not cease. Hmm. And the the natives attempted to push the mage lords from this island unsuccessfully, time after time, leading to losses on both sides, villagers, mage lords, and natives. And that this is the nuclear option that uh. That that accessing the flow of time, and you see the name Strauss in these papers, that trying to continue this particular line of magic manipulation was what Masak wanted to prevent, and in order to do that, decided he had to harness it. So, motivations are a little different than Yanis, but a similar descent into obsession. So, from what I understand, Yanis and uh, Masak here uh, were basically competing with each other to who can find the god first, right? Or whatever they were trying to do with this nuclear option here. You all were staring at the fountain when Jetta, reading through various papers and scrawlings, begins saying this to you off to the side. Perhaps to your surprise. What do you all do? You're saying that Musak could be behind all of this. I... What I'm thinking is it's a combination of Musak here... Yanis and uh, Strauss, they were all basically having a race to obtain power, whether that power is through meeting a god or harnessing that god's power for something. But I don't really know what exactly they were racing towards. Locke and Cult, you guys are more familiar with the machinations of Strauss. And though Jetta says Strauss, you know, of course, that the the third person in play was Fenwick, but thinking back to Strauss, you know that he was using the silver liquid in the fountain in the far cave to manipulate the flow of time and ascend to godhood. He was using, he was only really caught because people were used in his experiments, notably Byron, as well as many other children that went missing. And the the news that Masak and Yanis and potentially Fenwick are all trying to continue this line of development, weaponization, whatever you want to call it, does sort of shed light on maybe what's going on here. The four of you stand in this room, beginning to realize the scope of what you've stumbled into, that what happened with Strauss did not end with Strauss, and you're seeing those studies go unchecked. The third crystalloid fountain rests in front of you, glowing, pink, thrumming. What do the four of you do? Well, whatever they want, it's a bad idea for them to have, considering whatever the this split timeline nonsense is going on here. So let's let's end this madness. And uh, I go to the fountain, and I gotta cast like a level one or higher spell slot on it. Or that's what you all have uh, deduced so far. All right, I I do just that. Then I cast a level one spell slot into this fountain. Let's go it snare. You step forward to the crystal as everybody else uh, watches. You are animated by this new information. Place your hand on the crystal and cast Snare. And now a sensation that you've all experienced at least once. The crystal begins to glow and ring and hum and the room is filled with a crackling energy and a bright white light as the wine of energy released from this overwhelms your senses. It is only a few seconds of this as you are thrust through the strange, corrupted corridors of time back into the superposition, the village square where you originally were. A dead body lies on the ground in front of you that now none of you can recognize. And in the air floating are three pink crystals, each about the size of a coffin, containing within them one Fenwick, one Yanis, and one Masak. The three people at the core of this strange time-bound mystery are now encased in front of you, but the shimmering around you persists, as everything seems unreal and off-putting. What do you do? Now what? Yeah, that—that that is a great question, Jenna. Now what? Can I pull out one of the pocket crystals? Please. 
and I guess I'll burn a first level slot into it as well and cast shield. Okay. Maeve, are you intending to bring others with you or to explore this on your own? Just to kind of see what happens. Um, okay. As everyone's kind of just pondering, I'm just going to pull it out and go for it. Jetta, you scream, and now what? And Maeve pulls out a crystal and disappears next to you. Uh, at least this time, it didn't seem to be from a wild magic surge, but still, one of your people has left you. You appear in this void, this sphere in which you stand, where you see the three different timelines swirling around you, the sunset, the rain, and the midnight. The last time that you tried to walk into the midnight timeline, you were greeted with a crystalline barrier that prevented you from entering. Right. Uh, and then you instead went into the rainy timeline. What do you do now? I guess I'll just check to see if that crystal barrier is around any of the other ones. You step up to the rainy timeline from which you were just ejected, and the same barrier now forms, seeming as though that by by activating the crystal, you have pruned this timeline. It still exists, but you can't enter it, and you drag your hand across the barrier that forms as you near it, and that continues to all three realities. You can no longer step through any of these into the different timelines. The crystal remains in your hand, but you stand here alone, understanding that you can't proceed into them. Um, well, crap. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Um, why don't you go back to the others <laughs> while I think about this? <laughs> okay. So Maeve has disappeared. The three of you are now standing in front of these three crystals floating in the air in front of you. The last time you interacted with them, they reflected spells, they reflected damage. The one thing that did happen that wasn't just a pure reflection is when you cast a spell, even though it affected you too, uh, it created a silhouette of two other missing crystals in the air, and those spaces, Jetta, are now filled. What looked like silhouettes before are now actually crystals with Yanis and Masak inside of them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a hand on Masak's crystal and just be like, see if I feel anything. You feel the same thrum of energy that you feel from active crystals, the large ones or a small one when you cast a spell into them. I, do I have anything that won't just like murk me if I cast it into it? Let's see here. Uh, you know what? I do have identify prepared. I will cast identify using a first level spell slot. Now, Cult has approached the crystal and slowly rested his hand on it. Locke and Jetta, do you have any reaction to this given your experience or the absence of Maeve? Uh, don't, uh, do anything that'll hurt you. These crystals reflect magic. I only seek information. So long as you ain't throwing out, like, anything that makes, that hurts you, or makes you laugh. Oh, no. No, I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to cast Identify. I want to know if there's anything special okay. about this. <laughs> You're gonna know yourself now. <laughs> hey, but either way, I'm happy. That should do the trick, or at least not backfire horribly. Can you read the description of Identify to me, Ryan? You choose one object that you must touch throughout the casting of a spell. If it is a magic item or some other magic imbued object, you learn its properties and how to use them, whether it requires attunement to use and how many charges it has, if any. You learn whether any spells were affecting the item and what they are. If the item was created by a spell, you learn which spell created it. If you instead touch a creature throughout the casting, you learn what spells, if any, are currently affecting it. When you place your hand on the crystal... You have a moment of clarity about its existence, and a swirl of images rush through your mind. Not just the crystal itself, but the fountains, your experiences during the Strauss incident. The silver liquid that flowed through the fountains comes to mind, but all this flashes away when you do see your own reflection in the crystal and have a deep connection with your own self and understand that you are being influenced and uh, scanned by the Identify spell. Uh, and it creates a feedback loop, and your mind turns to mush. No. Um, <laughs> and my head explodes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this doesn't last terribly long, because the energy that you cast into the crystal that would have created the silhouettes before now instead flows into the other two. And Maeve, you don't know what happens, but you are suddenly ripped from the void back into the space between the other three. And in front of you are Masak, Yanis, and Fenwick, trapped in pink amber, call it the flow of your magics animate them for the first time since their suspension above you. The crystals are solid, but they now seem filled with horrified prisoners struggling to move as if swimming ferociously to escape this menagerie. 
and beams of cold light crack through the magical gems like they were glass. Unnatural vibrations leave the houses and walkways around you flattening, forming another multicolored maelstrom, another swirling orb of reality around you. The crystals crack open as the bodies of Masak, Yanis, and Fenwick fuse into the bones of a new beast, a corrupted ball of time and flesh. Oh. The time-locked abominations of Nar Enial were an insufficient blueprint for this horror. Oh. Crystals melt into silver blood, filling the disparate arms and twisted stalks topped with unblinking eyes. Lema cried out for your help, and now you might know why. The three wounded souls assaulted on her power unrelentingly, and now you face the grotesque embodiment of their contempt, their failure, and their rage. Its enormous mouth gapes, and its scream fills the chamber around you. A fusion of the three fountain rooms, adorned temple, blooming gardens, craggy cave floors, and pooling water, lifeless stone bricks, and the scars of Strauss's treason, without which this new nightmare would not exist. There are no exits, just the four of you, and what remains of those three. Roll for initiative. A little flowers for Algernon, not quite the end of the story. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Jesus Christ. What do you mean, Jesus Christ? That's a, that is, that is a, a common thing to reference. What's Flowers of Algernon? It's a, it's a book. We're not doing this right now. We're not doing yeah, this right now. Yeah, don't worry about yeah. it. Just Google yeah. it later, Chatter. Um, or ch Flowers for Charlie, if you prefer the uh, <laughs> Always Sunny <laughs> always Interpretation. Sunny. <laughs> Indubitably. <laughs>